Hello Internet, Seth Skorakowski, and today we'll be taking a look at the Call of Cthulhu adventure, The Necropolis. Written by Lee Carr, the scenario first appeared in 2017 as a convention demo game available for members of the Cult of Chaos. In 2019, it was revised and released in Gateways to Terror, which is the version that I ran. The adventure, like all the ones in Gateways to Terror, is intended as a short introductory scenario intended to introduce new players to Call of Cthulhu, as well as be playable in only one or two hours. The adventures are full of keeper tips on running them, and they're fully playable with the starter set. So any keepers who have the starter set and not the full core rulebook yet, they can still easily play these. The scenario takes place in 1924 at an archaeological dig in Egypt, and provides us with four pre-generated characters, not including the pre-gens and the handouts, the whole scenario itself is about 14 pages long. I ran this adventure for some friends of mine, and they've been really wanting to get into tabletop games, and they wanted to try Call of Cthulhu out, because uh, evidently I tend to talk about Call of Cthulhu a lot. I chose the Necropolis not only because it's short and simple adventure, but also because one of them was their 12-year-old son, and the subject matter that's covered in the adventure uh, was still age-appropriate, and probably something that he would enjoy. Now being intended to play in only an hour or two, the scenario is pretty simple. I mean, you really can't do a complex investigative plot in only an hour, uh, so this is more of a dungeon crawl and survival adventure with no NPC roleplay at all. However, me being me, I also made a couple small changes to the scenario as well as to the pre-generated characters, and as advertised, the whole thing took us about two hours to complete it. So what I'm going to do is offer my thoughts, my suggestions, and my criticisms as a game master who has successfully run this adventure. And I'm Jack the NPC. I'm here to give it to you from a player side of things as I get to explore an ancient Egyptian temple for the furtherment of our knowledge and the protection of our history. <laughs> who am I kidding? I'm going to be doing this for the fortune and glory, kid. I fully admit it. But before we go any further, I must warn you that there will be spoilers. So any players in the audience, please stop here. Send your game masters this way to see about running the adventure for you. But if you keep going and you spoil yourself, you'll be forced to endure the hum die. Okay, keepers, let's dive in. As I said, the adventure is intended as an introductory scenario that's playable in just one or two hours. It gives us these four pre-generated characters, each with their own skills and equipment, but I'm not a fan of these character sheets. They don't show all the skills, and with Call of Cthulhu, a character has a chance of succeeding with any skill in the game, and I also wanted to make a few changes, so I made these full character sheets for my players to use. Now, some of the changes that I made were languages. Languages are a big part of this scenario, specifically German and the ability to read hieroglyphics, but only the language professor has those two skills, and well, yes, their skill in it is pretty good, there is still always that chance of failure, and I wanted to give some of the other players at least a decent chance of being able to try this out, so I added those languages to some of the other characters, but at a much lower rating, you know, 20, maybe 30%. Then, shortly before I ran it, I found out that we might have a player that's joining us, so I made two more character sheets for us to use. Uh, one of them is going to be used as a possible NPC backup character in case one of the PCs died. I stuck a link below in the video description to anyone that might want to download and use my pre-filled in character sheets. Once the players have selected which character they want, they're still going to need to roll their luck stat and fill that in. The adventure gives us a time structure in order to track your progress as you're running the game if you're wanting to keep the game down to being just one hour long, such as the initial set up, passing out the character sheets, then rolling up their luck, a crash course in the rules, and delivering the plot setup should all be done in five to ten minutes. Then followed by the expected time frames for the different location scenes and coming to the conclusion somewhere between 40 and 50 minutes in. Of course, if you're not going to be running this game for a convention or a demo game in some sort of uh, restricted time slot, you don't need to worry about sticking to this time frame, but I also think it's a really good way for keepers to at least kind of measure and gauge where their own progress is if they're trying to run this scenario as far as, you know, kind of expect how much longer they have or kind of how well they're staying on track in order to complete the scenario in a good time. I honestly can't see you running just a one hour game. I mean, six hours? Sure, seen that one a lot. But one hour? It's usually about the time you're getting warmed up. Yeah, I can't picture it either. Running a convention game is a very specific game master skill that I just don't have. I've watched people do it, and I am always amazed that they can pull it off as smoothly as they do. 
The adventure is set in the Valley of the Kings, since our heroes are leading an archaeological dig. We have our archaeologist, a professor of languages, the dilettante who's funding the expedition, and the dilettante's bodyguard, a former soldier. The diggers have just uncovered a tomb entrance buried in the sand, and using ropes and pulleys have hoisted up this giant stone slab that's been sealing the entrance. Our heroes, wanting to be the first in this newfound tomb, are going to be the first to step inside of it. Holy crap, guys. After weeks of living in the desert and getting sand in all my cracks, we have hit pay dirt. Those Bimbridge scholars, they're going to be kissing my sandy ass now after this discovery. Ain't nothing going to be able to ruin my day now. All of a sudden, there's a cry of alarm behind them, and then with the grinding of stone and a big crash, the stone slab slams shut behind them, trapping all of our heroes inside the tomb and in total darkness. Aziz, light! Aziz? Ah, crap. Don't worry, guys. I am sure that they are working their butts off right now to get that door back up. If you listen closely, we can probably hear them frantically trying to rescue us. Are, are they laughing at us? Ah, oh, crap. We're screwed. It's at this moment, once the players have already become trapped, that the game actually begins. Of course, if you're wanting to do a longer adventure and there's no time restraints that you're dealing with, you can start the adventure out earlier. However, doing that also runs the risk of that one player who decides that their character doesn't want to be among the first characters inside this tomb. You know, maybe even they hang back, saying that they're going to uh, manage the stone slab door being lifted up, either for legitimate reasons, like that's something their character would do, or because the player knows that they're playing Call of Cthulhu and they're just simply trying to, you know, stop the bad thing from happening to them. It's like, it's like they come to a game and then they do everything in their power not to play the game that they and everyone else came for. I, I just don't get it. So Keepers, if you are going to start this game off a little bit earlier than when the scenario begins and you're just going to trust your player characters that they're all going to enter the tomb first, you might want to give some thoughts as far as a definite reason that they should go in first. So uh, maybe if you make up an NPC who's the real person in charge of this entire thing, you know, the head financier, and they could tell the player characters to go in. So you know, now it's like their bosses say, hey everybody, you should be the first ones in here. Or if you have some sort of you know, NPC photographer that's on the scene with them, you know, he's on the site and he's all like, you know, hey everyone, to mark this historic occasion, you should all stand at the entrance and I'm going to take your picture and you're going to be world famous because this picture is going to be on the front page of every newspaper in the world. So the player characters, you know, they all stand inside the entrance to pose for this photograph and then this uh, cry of alarm and this giant stone slab comes slamming down, you know, maybe even uh, crushing the photographer. So it's like all the lights go out and everybody kind of feels this kind of wet splatter on their face. You know, that's a great way to start the game. In a pinch, if you do have that one player character that didn't want to go inside, you could have it where they're captured by the cultists and then just tossed in just moments before the entrance is sealed. Or you could roleplay them, you know, fighting it out with the cultists outside, but that also does run the risk of killing that player character before the adventure really begins. But if you do, you could just hand that player one of the NPC characters. If you have an NPC accompanying the PCs inside, so it's like, ah, oh, hey, I'm sorry you died, but here's here's Billy. Get to play him now. However you want to do it is fine. It's your table. You can make it up for yourself. Just be aware that if you allow your players to have control earlier in the adventure, you are leaving yourself open to have one or more of them intentionally or unintentionally resist the simple plan of you all step into the tomb first. The tomb layout is pretty simple. We get a keeper map with tags denoting important places and things, as well as two player maps, one for the initial layout and a second for the expanded layout with everything revealed. Now, the first problem that the player characters are going to encounter is light. One of the PCs has four candles, each of those with a burn time of only a single hour. Of course, clever player characters can try making a torch out of some of the stuff that they got around here. Like maybe the part of a broken chair leg and some of the cloth of their clothes that's been drenched in booze as an accelerant. Keepers might want to give one of the player characters something in their inventory, like a cane or a walking stick that they can use to make a torch. Once they have light, the PCs can explore, reading ancient murals of the pharaoh who rejected the Egyptian gods in favor of the ones that he beheld in his visions. They also might discover four mummified dogs that have been placed inside wall niches. Players are probably going to assume that those mummified dogs are going to come to life and chase them through the darkened hallways, because, you know, they know they're playing Call of Cthulhu. But ain't nothing like that gonna happen here. Those are just mummified dogs. But maybe they can use their wrappings and their bones to make themselves some torches. 
They'll also discover signs of a previous expedition that had entered this tomb before them. It was also here and here that I decided to drop in a pair of poisonous snakes. Reason being that I just wanted to inject in a little excitement to the adventure because once again I did have a 12 year old playing with me and I figured he might like to have a little bit of excitement here. In the antechamber room, which is piled with treasure, there's also a spear and a sword in the hands of some mummies on either side of a sealed doorway. Now, neither the spear and sword skills are normally listed on the character sheet, but both skills begin at 20%. Uh, so for my game, I went ahead and put those on the sheet using just the same slot and listed the starting skill out because I can almost promise you that once the characters find a sword and a spear, somebody's going to pick up that sword and spear and want to use them. The investigators should also discover some more murals, and these depicting monsters and mythos symbols, they'll also discover a crushed skeleton of a German archaeologist from a few years prior, and through making some German language roles, they can go ahead and read his diary, which tells of his own discovery of this lost tomb, and ominously ends with the statement that something is inside here with him. Now anytime during this, keepers can go ahead and have the monster awaken, but I strongly suggest that just for dramatic purposes, you hold off until someone in the group has read the German journals and the murals. And then, once that's done, go ahead and find out where everybody is in this tomb, because that might be spread out across several rooms, and then go ahead and awaken the monster. The abomination itself is a giant, monstrous, wolf-headed mummy thing. And once it awakens, it heaves out the giant stone slab from the sealed doorway, and it begins stalking this tomb. This is the exciting part of the adventure right here, as this creature starts coming out of the darkness, you know, sniffing and huffing and looking for intruders. Keepers, it is very important that you've been building the mood of this place up this entire time, and right here, you definitely gotta keep that thing going. So give us some of the other senses, you know, maybe the smell, this kind of sour, rotted stink as that door pushes open. It's kind of coming off of this creature in waves, you know, almost making him dizzy with the stink. Maybe the sound of, you know, its claws across the floor and it's sniffing. Maybe the sound of some of the treasure, you know, clattering to the floor as its big bulk is moving through the antechamber between the mounds of treasures. Maybe they're not going to be able to see it too well, right? Because, you know, they got some weak light sources. There's just all the debris that's in the antechamber that's blocking their view. So maybe they get to have something like, you know, a silhouette of it, or maybe just a little peek of what this thing is. Like they're hiding underneath the table and they see this big clawed foot just step past him and move past. The player character's like, oh my god, what the hell is that? The longer you can keep it going and not showing the full reveal of this thing, the more that fear is going to mount up and the better it's going to be. Now witnessing this monster can of course cause a bout of madness, and the module gives us a nice chart for each character showing what their individual reaction to sanity loss would be, and I think that's a really nice touch to do in adventures that have pre-generated characters is to go ahead and give suggestions as far as what those individual characters will do if they have a, a bout of madness or sudden sanity loss and what their reaction would be. A direct fight against this abomination is probably going to end pretty badly for the characters. I mean, this thing is seriously tough, and its fighting ability and its damage output are just so high that it's scoring a one-hit kill against a player character is pretty likely. Now, because this creature is huge, it has a build of four, that does give a bonus die for any of the player characters to hit it, which is great. But with the low light conditions that they have, if they're trying to fight this thing in the darkness while holding a candle, that might also give them a penalty die that cancels that out. So just be aware of what the light sources are, and you know what, uh, who should be getting penalty die because they might not have enough light, or maybe they're going to be dropping a candle if they fail or fumble or anything like that, and that's going to plunge them all into darkness. The module does give us a few possible ways this adventure might go, as far as you know the characters they might uh, escape or kill this monster. The most the ideal way of doing that is to go ahead and try to sneak past the monster, locate the treasury, and destroy the still beating heart that's inside one of the canopic jars, and destroying the heart will kill it instantly. For us, because I was playing with new players who might not have understood how lethal this monster was, I went ahead and had an NPC that was accompanying with them. Uh, he, he was there, and the monster saw him, and it just immediately just cleaved him in half with one blow with its big sword, and that kind of told the PCs that, yeah, this thing is pretty damn lethal. And it also gave the player characters, you know, a full round that they might be able to, you know, hopefully get away from it because it was engaged with this NPC, you know, uh, maybe, you know, scramble and hide and maybe find that heart and try to kill this thing. 
However, instead of doing any of that stuff, my players just decided to bum rush the damn thing. Uh, they did get a bonus die because they were outnumbering it, but their weapons and fighting skills were also pretty bad. And then one of the PCs got killed, and then another one got hit and knocked down to like one or two hit points. Now, finally, the plucky kid character, who was also played by a 12 year old player, he'd been hiding this whole time in one of the boats. He didn't want to act at all against this big scary monster, but he finally sprang into action in round three or four, and he managed to pull off a surprise ambush against it, and he was the one that killed the monster. It was awesome. Now, with the monster dead, I decided that I should go ahead and just keep this tension going. So, what I decided that this uh, black goo that was bleeding from all its wounds and now splattered everywhere against the walls, it began slowly kind of rolling its way back toward the body. So, the player character seeing that, they decided to dismember the monster, and I started describing how all the pieces of this monster that they had cut off, you know, began kind of slowly sliding back toward one another, like this creature was going to reassemble itself eventually. The players being players, we of course considered setting that thing on fire. RPG players and pyromaniacs might as well be synonyms for each other, am I right? However, keepers, you might consider letting them have an intelligence check here just to remember that we're in a pretty enclosed space with little to no air movement, and fire with a lot of smoke probably ain't a good idea. And this, of course, gave him the encouragement to search around the tomb and maybe find some alternate means of destroying the creature, which, of course, was destroying the still beating heart. Now, once they destroyed the heart, the monster's remains just instantly melted away into black goo. Now, once the creature is destroyed, the last thing left to do is escaping. The most obvious way, of course, is to use the dynamite that they found on the dead German archaeologist to just blast the door out of the way. And they can use mechanical repair or use a hard no roll if none of them have demolitions, which none the pre-generated characters have demolitions. However, they've only got one stick of dynamite, so they've only got one shot at being able to do this properly, so hopefully they've got a few luck points left over in order to burn it on this in order to get out alive. However, setting off that dynamite is going to cause a cave-in, so if the player characters, you know, set it off and they just rush outside, that's fine, you know. Just describe to them the way this place is kind of coming apart and falling apart all around them as they're racing towards the exit. But if the players decide at that point to stop and start grabbing all this treasure before they run out, you might want to use some dodge or some luck rolls to determine if they're able to grab any of this treasure and escape with any of the loot. Why would they wait till after the dynamite explodes to start gathering treasure? I mean, I've been loading my pockets with it the whole time I've been here. I mean, that is called planning ahead. Of course, having pockets full of jingle and treasure might explain why I've been failing all my stealth checks. Overall, we had a blast with this adventure. It delivered exactly what it set out to do. It is an exciting introductory game, playable in just a short amount of time. However, that also requires it being a rather simple adventure. I mean, we have no real roleplay, no real investigation, which are pretty big aspects of Call of Cthulhu. I mean, those are some of the big selling points that I tell people. It kind of turns this adventure into more of a D&D style dungeon crawl where combat is the most likely solution to whatever the player problems are. Personally, I'm fine with that. For me, this adventure hit absolutely everything I needed for both the audience that I had and the time constraints that I was working with, and they have now asked me if I can go ahead and run them through a second adventure, which means this adventure did nail its goal. It was a fun experience that left the audience wanting more, and they've asked me to do it again. But now I just need to find myself another short scenario that is both age-appropriate and exciting enough to hold a 12-year-old's interest, and also isn't any of the ones that I've already reviewed before, because he's already watched all those reviews and therefore is spoiled on them, so I can't do any of those again, so I'm gonna have my work cut out for me. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a thumbs up. If you want to see some more of our stuff, such as game reviews, how-tos, RPG philosophy, just hit that subscribe button. Till next time, gamers, you have a great day. You know, what I think would be pretty cool is if you took this adventure, but you changed the timeline of events on it. So instead of taking place in 1924, you started a bit earlier, like maybe 1904, 1914, shortly before the war started. So if your players play this adventure and they come back and they're like, oh my god, that was wonderful, I'd like to play some more Call of Cthulhu, you could be all like, oh great, sure, let's do a campaign and let's roll up some characters for you. So the players, they roll up their characters and their game starts in 1924. And once they start, they're quickly recruited 
recruited by an investigator organization that is bound and determined to destroy the mythos threat, and the player characters discover that the four people in charge of that investigator organization are the four characters from this adventure right here, because this was the prequel adventure to their current campaign where those characters discovered the mythos threat that was just hiding just below the surface. Plus, that's when they got the money that was able to fund this whole thing that's been going on for 10 or maybe 20 years as they're trying to stop the threat. I think that could be pretty cool.